Imagine a world with 10,000 sperm whales and 10,000 humpback whales roaming the Earth's oceans. Now, imagine a world with 20,000 sperm whales, but no humpbacks. Holding everything else equal between these two worlds, does it matter which one we live in? Is one of them better than the other? Suppose we live in the first world with an even split and permit a lucrative fishing practice that wipes out the remaining humpbacks, but allows the sperm whales to flourish and double their numbers. Does it matter that this world lost its 10,000 humpbacks and replaced them with 10,000 sperm whales? Would we have done anything wrong? If you're like me, you'll agree that a world with some sperm whales and some humpbacks is much better than a world with just extra sperm whales. Perhaps you'll also join me in opposing any practices that might threaten to wipe out the Earth's humpbacks. But these judgments have some puzzling features. For an isolation, an individual humpback whale and an individual sperm whale are roughly similar in ways that might matter from a moral point of view. For example, they're roughly comparable in their intelligence and in their capacity to suffer. So at first glance, it's puzzling why the 10,000 extra sperm whales wouldn't compensate for the loss of the 10,000 humpbacks. But when we step back and think about this from the point of view of species, things look quite different. If species matter, then a world with two species is better than one. If species matter, then it's wrong for us to cause their extinction, even if it's lucrative to do so. This idea that species matter pops up again and again in conservation contexts. Consider the white-tailed deer and the Bawean deer. White-tailed deer are relatively abundant in North and South America, and each year hunters kill these animals en masse. The Bawean deer, in contrast, is found only on a single island in Indonesia, and is currently listed by the IUCN as critically endangered. Perhaps under 400 individuals remain alive today. As a result, there are strict laws that protect these deer from harm. When we think about these deer as individual animals, this asymmetry doesn't make much sense. For there's nothing about a Bawian deer that makes it inherently superior to a white-tailed deer. But again, when we step back and look at it from the point of view of species, we can spot the underlying rationale. The Bawian deer is nearly extinct, and by protecting individual Bawian deer, we might thereby prevent the extinction of the species. But do species really matter? We can't just assume that they do. If species do matter, then ideally, we'd have some explanation that tells us why they matter, why we ought to restrain ourselves in order to prevent their extinction and invest in their protection. As a philosopher, it's my job to ask these sorts of questions. But I also do think that the extinction of any species is a very bad thing. And I wonder if these attitudes can ultimately be justified. Addressing this question is not merely a theoretical exercise, either. Different positions on the value of species give different answers to concrete, practical questions that we face. For example, how much should we invest in preventing extinction from happening? Should we pour our resources into only those species that might benefit us? Or should all species be given consideration, regardless of how much they might benefit us, regardless of how much it might cost? No one really doubts that species can be useful to us in various ways. Many people depend on other species for their livelihoods, and some species play important roles in their ecosystems. So part of the reason why species are valuable is that they provide useful services. Philosophers call this kind of value instrumental value. It's the kind of value that a thing has in virtue of its usefulness. However, not all species are very useful in these ways. And if species are valuable solely in virtue of their usefulness, then perhaps it ultimately doesn't make sense to invest in protecting species that are not ecologically or economically significant. And if we could find a technological replacement for species, robotic bees say, then perhaps it doesn't matter if it's the species or our technology that's providing us with those services. On the other hand, if species matter for their own sake, then perhaps we ought to invest in their protection even if they're not economically or ecologically significant. In that case, perhaps the loss of a species would be a bad thing even if they're not very useful. This is the kind of idea that I've always been drawn towards. It's always seemed to me that species have a special kind of value that's independent of us, what philosophers call intrinsic value. This is the kind of value that you and I are thought to have. We're deserving of respect and moral consideration regardless of how useful we are to others. We have value simply in virtue of being what we are. It seems that many people who share my environmentalist values generally assume that a position like this is correct that species really are intrinsically valuable. However, it turns out to be really difficult to justify a view like this. In fact, 
I think it's fair to say that it's a minority view among philosophers who work in environmental ethics. To get a sense for why it's such a hard problem, it'll help to pause and reflect a little bit on the nature of species. What kind of a thing are species? Are they even things at all? According to one popular account, species are collective entities made up of individual organisms. An analogy here is the relationship between individual cells and multicellular organisms. For example, I'm a collective entity made up of trillions of individual cells, and on this approach, each individual organism is a part of the species in the same way that each of my cells is a part of me. Unfortunately, there are some problems with this account. For if species are collective entities, they're a strange sort of collective, since the individual organisms that make up a species are typically spread over a wide area and don't exhibit the same degree of functional integration that the cells of an organism do. This calls into question the aptness of that analogy. But even if this approach to species did work, still it wouldn't be clear why species mattered for their own sakes. Not every collective is morally important. For example, we don't have obligations to protect every collective of H2O molecules that forms a cloud. As collectives, species lack familiar sources of moral value. For example, as collectives, species do not suffer and are not intelligent. Those are traits possessed by individual organisms. So what is it about species that makes them deserving of consideration? Why does the species, rather than just the individual organisms that make up the species, morally important? These are difficult questions, and good answers to them have not been forthcoming. A different approach treats species as what philosophers call natural kinds. Natural kinds are not concrete entities in the world, but rather abstract categories that things may or may not fall under. The elements provide helpful illustrations. Consider the element gold, for example. We say that each gold thing is an instance or an example of gold. Each instance of gold falls under the general category of gold things. And when we are thinking about gold as a natural kind, we're thinking about it as a general category that things may or may not fall under. On this approach, species are something like general categories that organisms can fall under. So you and I are each human beings, so we each fall under the general category homo sapiens. Similarly, each individual gray wolf falls under the general category canis lupus, and the species itself is just this abstract category that contains all of the individual gray wolves. Unfortunately, there are problems with this account as well. To my mind, the most significant has to do with the fluidity of species boundaries. For example, if we could step back and watch evolution unfold over time, we would see ancestral forms blending seamlessly into descendant forms over the generations. It would not be possible to identify a definitive point at which the organisms started belonging to a new species category and stopped belonging to an old one. There is no essential trait or cluster of traits that definitively marks an organism as belonging to one species category rather than another. But even if a natural kinds approach did work for species, still, it wouldn't be clear why species were morally valuable, why they mattered for their own sake. Not every natural kind is morally important. For example, we don't have moral obligations to the element gold, and we're not obliged to make sure that there are samples from each different element present on Earth. So what makes species different? Why do we have obligations to make sure that there are samples from each species category present on Earth? This is an odd idea because in general, we don't have obligations to things like categories themselves. Even when our obligations involve categories, still, it seems like it is the individuals that are within the category to whom we are obliged. For example, plausibly, our obligations to combat racism and gender discrimination arise out of our obligations to the individual people who are actual or potential victims of these forms of discrimination. It doesn't seem like our obligations are to social categories in the abstract. So, to sum up, it's not clear what exactly species are, but neither major approach lends itself to the idea that species are intrinsically valuable, that species matter for their own sake. In some of my recent work, I've started developing an alternative approach that can sidestep some of these problems that we just ran into. The key move is to shift the focus away from species. At first, it seemed like we needed to appeal to species in order to explain why a world with two kinds of whale is better than a world with only one. And it seemed like the answer went roughly like this. Species have a special kind of value, and therefore, two species are better than one. 
It seemed like we also needed to appeal to species in order to justify our asymmetric treatment of the Bawean deer and the white-tailed deer. But it turns out this is not the only option. If we look instead at nature's spectacular biological designs, then a fruitful new way of approaching things opens up. Let me give you two examples to illustrate what I have in mind. This is the fog stand beetle, a tiny creature that lives in the Namib Desert in Africa. This is one of the driest regions on the planet, receiving on average less than two inches of rainfall per year. But water does move through the region in the form of fog clouds that pass over the desert's massive sand dunes. These beetles have a brilliant strategy for exploiting these clouds. When the fog is passing over the dunes, they scurry to the top and perch themselves like this, facing into the fog with their rears angled up at 45 degrees. Droplets of water condense onto tiny bumps on their shells and get funneled down into their mouths, enabling them to drink a significant fraction of their weight in water each day. And notice, what's remarkable here isn't just these beetles' water conjuring apparatus. They also have a sensory apparatus that's capable of identifying when it's time to run up the dunes, recognizing when they've reached the top, and detecting when they're satiated. The beetles competently time their behavior in response to these cues, giving rise to a complex ritual that enables them to survive in the harsh desert. This is a remarkable feat of engineering and serves as an excellent example of nature's design prowess. But lest you think I've given an unfairly spectacular example here, let me give you one more. Consider the Canada goose. Many people dislike these creatures, in part due to their abundant green poo. <laughs> But giving some thought to the underlying biological design can transform your attitude about even this unsavory aspect of these creatures. The special trick of most birds is flight, and everything about flighted birds is governed by the demands of flight. This includes everything from their uh, structure of their wings and feathers and the streamlining of their bodies, to their toothless beaks and their ultralight bone design. In order to remain ready to fly at a moment's notice, you can't sit around letting massive meals digest. The process needs to be quick and efficient. And so it's no surprise that most birds eat compact, calorie-dense foods and are constantly defecating. Against this backdrop, the Canada goose is an oddity. Unlike most other flighted birds, its body is built like a tank. And it needs to be large because it feeds largely on grass, a particularly inefficient food source that's difficult to digest. Just think about what other grass-eating animals are like. Cows, for example, are huge and have elaborate digestive systems that require considerable processing time. The Canada goose is able to get by with a much more compact stomach. It doesn't even need teeth. It's even able to extract enough energy from grass to power flight, a task made that much more impressive by its large body. In order to make this gambit work, it's not feasible to let the grass fully digest. The geese can't afford to carry around a cow-sized gut, and they need to expel waste frequently so that they're not weighed down, should the need to fly arise. So, as a result, they're passing large volumes of partially digested grass on a regular basis, giving us prodigious piles of waste that retains a characteristic greenish color. Just think about how amazing that is. Flying cows waddling all over your lawns. <laughs> Having given some thought, to the tensions that are balanced by this design, I don't even mind navigating around their droppings anymore. And this is just one aspect of these creatures. They have fascinating migratory capacities, charming parenting behaviors, and complex social lives, just for starters. Nature is replete with countless examples of this kind of breathtaking, remarkable biological design. Everywhere you look, you find creatures with stunning features that are the result of millions upon millions of years of natural selection. Each organism elegantly weaves together numerous biological designs into a tapestry of brilliant and staggering complexity. When people take the time to think about nature's spectacular biological designs, they tend to feel a sense of awe. In fact, it can be difficult to resist a sense of amazement and wonder. And this is an indication of the value of these biological designs. Our sense of awe, we might say, is an appropriate response to nature's marvelous handiwork. This insight points the way to an alternative approach that is not centered around species. According to this approach, it is nature's irreplaceable designs that are intrinsically valuable. A world with more of these designs is better off because of it. And when these designs are permanently lost, the world is thereby impoverished. When species go extinct, some of their designs are lost forever. 
And that is why a world with some humpbacks and some sperm whales is much better than a world with just extra sperm whales. All of the stunning features that are uniquely part of the humpback design would be lost for good. And 10,000 individual sperm whales don't compensate for that loss. More generally, a design-oriented approach agrees that it is good for us to invest in protecting species from extinction, and it's wrong for us to cause them to go extinct. So, it's capable of delivering many of the same results as a species-oriented account. But, unlike a species-oriented account, we don't need to answer the question of what species are or why they matter. However those debates turn out, still, there is biological design that enriches this world, and respecting its value requires us to take action. So, what the design-oriented approach gives us is an alternative rationale for some of our evaluative attitudes and conservation practices. We can justifiably retain our commitment to preventing species from going extinct, even when they're not very useful. But the ultimate justification for this is not that species are intrinsically valuable. Rather, it is that nature's spectacular biological designs are intrinsically valuable. And by protecting species, we thereby protect nature's marvelous works. The last three centuries have seen human activities cause hundreds of species to go extinct and place many more at risk of extinction. It's difficult to give precise figures, but a recent UN report estimates that as many as a million species are at risk of going extinct in just the next few decades. A defensible response to this challenge requires that we think carefully about what really matters. We are inheritors of a biosphere that is filled with marvelous, irreplaceable biological designs. The world will be impoverished by their loss, and collectively, we will bear much of the responsibility. But if we're able to rise to the challenge, then the planet can retain some of its natural splendor into the indefinite future. Thank you.